I'm John Heilman, and this is the Hell and High Water Podcast. My guest today, Dr. Mike Osterholm. I'm Mike Osterholm, and the state of the COVID-19 pandemic is at best confusing and one that is surely offers us very substantial challenges going forward. The threat of the Delta re- virus remains real, but we are prepared. We have the tools. We can do this. So all those of you who are unvaccinated, please get vaccinated for yourself and for your loved ones, your neighborhood, and for your community. And to the rest of America, this is no time to let our guard down. We just need to finish the job with science, with facts, and with confidence. And together, as the United States of America, we'll get this done. So that's Joe Biden in the East Room of the White House um, giving us another of uh, what become a, a, a kind of unending string of updates about where COVID stands and, and announcing some new policy measures. Um, we are here today on Hell and High Water with Dr. Michael Osterholm. Um, Mike, it's great to see you. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks, John. Good to be with you. Um, I want to start at, at, at 30,000 feet um, around, around that man, Joe Biden, who you served um, on, the, on the COVID transition advisory board for uh, a few months there from November to January, I believe. And, um, and now you're back on the outside, able to speak truth to power or, you know, uh, not or, or be able to lie to power either way, whatever you prefer. <laughs> um, how do you think he's doing on this? Well, let me put this into some perspective. I've served roles now in the last five presidential administrations. You know, I've always been nonpartisan. I'm just a, a science guy that's here to help. And uh, you know, for the first time in my public health career, I actually believe we have a vaccinator in chief, much like we saw during the days of polio. And from that perspective, I don't think there's anything more that we could ask of this president in terms of trying to get America vaccinated to protect them against this pandemic. Now, the question comes up, you know, are there things from an administration standpoint we can do better that we need to do more of? And the answer is absolutely yes. But I, I think that overall, uh, his heart and soul as a president of the United States is real. It's not a Democrat. It's not a Republican perspective when it comes to this virus. From my uh, standpoint, it's about how to save lives. And so from that perspective, I feel really very positive about what he's been doing. Do you think as you look at, at, at the performance and then there's no no one doubts that that the administration did an incredible job rolling out the vaccines in the first few months. Like that, there was a huge, a huge logistical challenge, infrastructure challenge, distribution challenge. You know the way they've handled the vaccines has been has been has been pretty incredible. Do you think on 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 messaging and on preparing the country for and dealing with the challenges of the Delta variant and f- future variants to come? Do you grade him as an A? Is he done as well as you think he could have done? Or are there things you would have said, all the things you just said that were complimentary, but I would have advised X, Y, or Z uh, to make this performance just a little better? Well, you know, the real challenge in trying to respond to this pandemic in the United States can in some ways be summarized by what those of us who have been in the business for as long as we have have experienced ourselves. What I mean by that, you know, I've been working on this uh, deal with infectious diseases for 46 years. And for the first time in my career, I've received death threats. Uh, I've received many, many very vile, vile communications. And uh, it's a, a situation where this isn't just about science. And this isn't just about a virus. This is about something much deeper than that. And I don't care who the president is. I don't care who the emperor is. I don't care who the benevolent dictator is. When you have that kind of underpinning to what you're trying to do, you've got a real hell of a challenge. And so I think that this administration uh, basically looked at the vaccine issue from a two-point perspective, and something, a title I had in one of my podcasts last fall, actually, before vaccine was available, called The Last Mile, The Last Inch. What you just referred to with the last mile was really remarkable what they did to scale up vaccine production. You know, we inherited, as a, he as an administration, her, inherited these vaccines, but they weren't really made for prime time manufacturing. And I think the administration did a tremendous amount of work to streamline that, to actually look at where were the weakest links in the manufacturing uh, chain and how to fix those. That's the last mile. The last inch was getting the needle in the arm. And I don't think anyone 
anyone fully understands yet the depth of resistance and why it happens to getting that done. And so I think short of a legal mandate that people would otherwise be imprisoned or whatever to get vaccinated, we have real challenges. And the administration basically, I think, is attempting now to address those issues in ways they hadn't before. I think that they thought that if we just talked about it enough and people saw the, uh, enough information about the vaccine that they would in fact embrace it. If anything, uh, that has hardened. It's not gotten easier. There are now, I think, three groups in this country. We used to think of two groups. The vaccine affirmative, couldn't wait to get their vaccine for their kids, for themselves, and the vaccine hesitant. People that wouldn't get it, anti-vaxxers that were really against it, but many would come to the point of getting it. Now we have a third group, the vaccine hostile. This is a group that will actually actively go out of their way to make it difficult for people to get a vaccine. And so I think in this case, I don't have any magic pixie dust answers for the administration other than to say, these are the things you just need to keep hitting home and hitting home. And, you know, tell the public the truth. The truth is this is a highly infectious virus that if you don't get vaccinated, you will know a COVID related outcome one way or the other. I want to ask you about booster shots just because it's one with the thing that's on everybody's mind right now. Having to get boosted this quickly uh, speaks to maybe a little bit that that these vaccines are not quite as 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 effective or as as durable as we had all hoped. Yeah. Well, let me unpack a couple of different issues here that I think are really important to distinguish. First of all, let's talk about the difference between a prime series and a booster dose. And that's important because we all started out with the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, with the two-dose approach. Of course, the J&J was the one vaccine uh, dose approach. Um, when that was all put together as an approach, basically, we didn't have good information about what happens at three, five, six, 10, 12 months because we're in the middle of a crisis. Right. So the immediate assessment of those vaccines was to find out in the short term, using these two dosing approaches, can we in fact develop antibody to uh, the vi virus and more importantly, other aspects of the immune system and then had gain protection. And the vaccines did that very well with one exception. And that was in the immune compromised or in some cases people we'd call immune senescence, people who are elderly and frail. Right. And so those people never really did develop a full response. And we now have data supporting that a third dose will actually get them over the finish line to have a response. So I don't want anyone to confuse the third dose of what was recommended last week for the immune compromised as a booster. It's not. It's the prime series, just like in children where we see right. three and four doses of vaccine needed before they finally have the appropriate full response. And so what we have to understand is we're kind of building this plane at 30,000 feet as we're flying, not around safety, but around how to best use the vaccines. And that's what's happening with the booster doses. And so I, I think that you're gonna see over the course of the next uh, three to five weeks, more data coming out that basically say for most people, uh, these vaccines are very, very effective in reducing serious illness, hospitalizations, and deaths without a booster. For some, those are likely going to be necessary. And trying to figure that out is what I call corrected science. Right. And, and that's important because most people think of it as misinformation. Uh, you know, you didn't really know what you were doing. And in fact, no, this is science at its best. We <laughs> yeah. learn something, we apply it. We learn more, we apply it. And so that's how I see the boosters. I don't see this as a failure of the vaccines. I see it as us learning how to best use them. Um, I want to ask you one last question before we take a quick break. And that relates to your home state um, where uh, you have the Minnesota State Fair coming up soon, I, I read. And uh, that at the end of the month, August 26th to September 6th, where the fair is uh, is not asking. Uh, there's no no mask mandate at the fair and there's no uh, proof of vaccination and nor a, a proof of a negative test. Has Minnesota gone off the rails here or does that make sense to you that you have a Minnesota State Fair without any of those protections under the current circumstances in which we live? As a nation, we have finished with the virus long before it finished with us. And I think that you couldn't be an elected official today to say close down the state fair. The public wouldn't stand for it, yeah. but the public will pay a price. And I think we're going to see more of these super spreading events with these outdoor events. And all we can do is continue to urge people, please, if you do go, 
you know, wear respiratory protection, wear an N95, know that if you're indoors and you're in crowds, that's a higher risk than being outdoors, but outdoors is not perfectly safe. This pandemic is gonna go on for a while. And until we do a better job of getting the world vaccinated, we've got to understand we're going to be living with this. This year, the 4th of July is a day of special celebration. For we are emerging from the darkness of years, a year of pandemic and isolation, a year of pain, fear, and heartbreaking loss. Today, all across this nation, we can say with confidence, America is coming back together. 245 years ago, we declared our independence from a distant king. Today, we are closer than ever to declaring our independence from a deadly virus. We're getting back to, you know, the things that we love. I mean, think about it. Hugging, hugging the people we love. Catching up with our friends face to face. Smiling at strangers. This is Independence Day weekend, almost. And I'm so glad that we can spend it here with the people who matter to us most. And doesn't the air just smell so much sweeter without our masks? It did. It smelled a lot sweeter without our masks, Mike. Um, and, and then now we have our masks back on. Um, I, 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 it, I'm, not, I'm not playing this sound just to, to mock them, right? They were caught up in a moment, as were a lot of us. I mean, everybody, include myself, of, of optimism about the possibility that we turn the corner on this virus. And, and everybody was, you know, natural human inclination to be um, to, to start to kind of get back to normal, given the nightmare we'd gone through for the year prior. We all got a little over our skis. We're, are there is there stuff we can point to right now where we say these are other bad consequences that came from that moment where we should have been more cautious and that we should learn from for the future? You know, one of the things I think that hasn't really been understood is just what is the influence of the media and what is the influence of programs like this? And, and uh, you have done a great job of covering this topic. But, you know, I, uh, as some know, I've often been labeled and uh, as unfortunately as Dr. Doom or Dr. Gloom, because I said right through the spring into the early summer that this virus was not done with us and that we had a sufficient number of people in this country who had not been vaccinated nor having previous infection that we could see a surge just like we saw and we're seeing now. And so for me, well, I'm not surprised where we're at right now uh, at all. Uh, but it was really hard to talk about that. And I actually had news media shows, as you know, I have been on a number of them, one of the talking <laughs> heads, where producers would say, you know, we're, we're, we're just not interested in having your message right now. So, uh, you know, we're kind of going to take a pass on that because we're, we're beyond that now. We're, we're, we're out there. We're, we're okay. And, you know, there was no amount of scientific reasoning that would come with that. A number of my colleagues who, again, were, I'll label affectionately the talking heads like myself, who assured the public that, in fact, all the modeling data said the summer was going to be quiet. And we might see a little bit of an uptick in the fall. And I think that we all collectively as a nation helped each other get to that point of what you heard the president and the first lady say. And it wasn't just politics. It wasn't just in it. it was the media. It was everybody. Yep. And so I think that what we need now is just, you know, how do we talk about this without it being Dr. Doom or Gloom? I'll tell you right now, this surge, which is bad, it could get even worse if we see some of these regional areas like the southeast, Georgia, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, South Carolina, North Carolina really emerge as they appear to be now, or the Northwest, or the upper Midwest, or even Southwestern United States, we can see this surge prolonged for at least another six to eight weeks. And But it's going to go down. It's going to go down. And yeah. we're going to hit another October, early November time period where I think things will be very quiet in this country. But we'll still have 80 million people left who will not have been vaccinated or protected from this virus by having had it yet. Yeah. 80 million is a lot of wood for this coronavirus forest fire to burn. Yeah. So when ha the next surge happens, are we gonna be just as surprised? Are we gonna be taken back by that? 
And I think that's the mindset that we have to start looking at this pandemic in. And clearly on a global basis, that's it. I mean, you, you, you may not like the data in terms of where it comes from, but Iran has just gone through their fifth surge after they were, everyone said after the second surge, they were done. They'd hit herd immunity. And in this fifth surge, they hit the highest number of cases ever just last week. So I think the world isn't yet prepared to understand that this pandemic is going to go on for a while. And until we do a better job of getting the world vaccinated, we've got to understand we're going to be living with this. Everybody agrees Donald Trump, except for Donald Trump, who thinks Donald Trump did a great job. He's still out there saying on TV that he handled this great and that everything was fantastic under him uh, in handling COVID. But other than Donald Trump, everyone thinks Donald Trump did a horrible job uh, handling COVID. Everybody. Is there something a president could have done that would have made this not all go away, but that it was suppress this in a more yeah. fundamental way so that the, like the course of the disease of the, invi- of, the, of the pandemic would have been fundamentally altered if we'd gotten at it early in the right ways? The bottom line is, is that in the long run, this virus was going to do what it was damn going to do. And I know that sounds um, a bit uh, fatalistic, uh, but I think the one thing that we have been successful at is vaccine. And I give the Trump administration credit for helping bring those through. But if you look, I mean, here we are today in this administration, which has you know, done everything I think that they possibly could. And yet this past week, if you looked at the top 12 locations in the world as countries for incidents of COVID, five of our states, if they had been countries, would have been in the top 12. Mm. I mean, how how can you reconcile that now where we have vaccines and we have a country that is so well aware of this? Yeah. And so part of it is, you know, I think that people just didn't understand, even if you look around the world right now, Australia. Look at the challenges. Vietnam. If I had a nickel for every time somebody said to me, well, do it like India's doing it or do it like Sweden or do it like Vietnam. And now look today, the challenges they have. Even China has been yeah. in large national lockdowns over the last three weeks to try to control this. So this is points out just, however, that as this virus unfolds over time, we were never going to put the genie back in the bottle. We never were. The question is, How fast can we get people vaccinated? That's going to be the ultimate answer of where we go with this. And that's not a partisan answer. That just says why pandemics are what they are. You know, I have to just say, you know, my my bad days with this virus in terms of public relations started way back in January when I put out a statement on January 20th of 2020. This is going to be a pandemic. But it really hit home on March 10th of last year. I was on the Joe Rogan podcast. I remember. and, and I said at that time that this was going to last at least 18 months <laughs> and that there would, at that point we could have at least easily 480,000 deaths. Yes. You would have thought that I was predicting the return of God knows what. Yeah. I mean, the, the, people the flipped denial. Out. People flipped they did, out. But, you people know, and, and my challenge was I was wrong because it was 600,000 deaths yeah. Yeah. in those first 18 months. Yeah. And I think that that's the challenge we have today is people understanding why we need to be better prepared for pandemics. We need to have much more investment in vaccine in vaccine development that these can be readily administered. John, look at where we're at today. You know, we are still fumbling the ball and trying to get vaccines made for the world. Right. And so I, I think that the challenge I would have for the future is not just that this president could have done more because in fact, there surely are things that in the short term would have helped. But in the long pick run picture, this virus is going to do what it's going to do, minus our ability largely with vaccination and then the distancing issues and so forth. But um, beyond that, the virus is really in control. So I'm more optimistic long term than I am obviously short term. (laughs) Short term is where I think we have our real challenges. If you allow the virus to freely circulate in 93 million people and give it the opportunity to find vulnerable targets, you give it the opportunity to mutate and form another variant. People say, well, I'm healthy. The chances of my getting seriously ill is very, very low. So why do I need to worry about getting vaccinated? And the reason is it isn't all about you. 
Because if, in fact, you don't get vaccinated and you do get infected and you're part of the transmission chain and you allow it to infect someone else, you're propagating the ability of that virus to ultimately mutate. And if it does mutate to something that does evade the vaccine, then we really got a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Then we've really got a problem. Uh, so is that coming? Or is that where we're, I mean, Delta is really bad. It's even worse than we thought it was, Mike. Um, but, you know, Anthony Fauci and others, that's Fauci basically saying why everybody needs to get vaccinated, because if we don't get vaccinated, yeah. the mutants, will, the virus, the variants will spread. But his, the last thing is the thing everyone's scared of, right, is are we on our way? And again, you, you were, have pointed out a number of times in this podcast and elsewhere that the virus is going to do what it's going to do. Is the virus kind of inevitably going to mutate eventually towards a, vac- a, a thing that is resistant to these vaccines we developed? Well, the long and short answer is we don't know. But let's just look at what evidence we have about what might happen. First of all, I do agree completely with Tony's assessment. For a virus to basically overtake Delta, for example, it's got to be a virus that has some advantage. Is it more infectious? Uh, Is it more likely to evade immune protection? Well, evolution is all about viruses or bacteria or any other living species finding an advantage over some one of their others. And so, you know, the gravity of the situation, meaning which way will something fall, is going to be that the only thing I see happening over time is that a virus either becomes more infectious to overtake Delta or it does develop this ability uh, to evade immunity. Um, And I think we have to understand that that's a possibility. Will it absolutely happen? May not. Maybe what if Delta becomes the king of the block and is still around, uh, you know, four or five years from now? I don't know that. But the potential for that to happen is very real. And as much as Tony emphasized the 93 million Americans, which I fully agree with, yeah. I worry every day about the 6.4 billion people billion, living in yeah. low and middle income countries that have had less than 2% of them having access to the vaccine. Right. So That's where we're really going to continue to see the variant spin out. And if there was ever a reason for an international response of emergency proportion, it's not just the humanitarian issues. It's all about stopping these variants because we could have, John, one day, one, as Tony described, which could be much worse. In July of, of 2020, uh, at a CNBC virtual event, you said this is a very difficult virus to contain. It will never be fully stopped short of a vaccine. And even then it will be slowed down again. We're going to be dealing with this forever. What do you mean? What did you mean by that? What do you mean by that? What does dealing with it mean? What does forever mean? The right. possibility that it's never going to go away is the thing that terrifies most people. Well, when a new infectious agent like this evolves from, in this case, the animal kingdom and gets into humans, we will likely have a, a continued experience with that for as long as humans are around. I mean, take an example of HIV AIDS. You know, when HIV AIDS emerged really on a global basis back in the early 1980s, it had already been in the human population probably for decades in Africa, but not really spreading. When it took off, you know, it caused the horrible, horrible pandemic that it did in the sense of, of global transmission. Today, it's still here. It's under a much more manageable condition in terms of, of drugs. We unfortunately still don't have a vaccine. In low right. and middle income countries, it still is taking a tremendous toll. Um, and we're dealing with it. Most people would probably never even think of HIV AIDS as having been a pandemic at one point, yet it is. Right. What I see happening with this virus is, you know, it's not going to kill all of us off or it wouldn't have any place to reproduce. So somewhere there's going to be a static state situation that will exist where maybe it'll become a seasonal virus. where having 90 some percent of the population either protected from vaccine or previously having had infection. And then we'll see these peaks every, every winter or whenever they occur. And so it's not going to be the same as we see with these surges. That, that happens in the earliest years. Uh, and unless somehow we have no long-term memory in terms of our immune systems, we will one day come into a static state with this, much like we did HIV AIDS. And that's what we talk about by forever. So it's not the same right. with these surges like this, but it will nonetheless still be challenging. Uh, we're not gonna ever eradicate it out of the human population. Imagine if we didn't have the very, very important drugs we have today for HIV AIDS, because we don't have a vaccine yet for that. Imagine if we'd be in a world ravaged by HIV AIDS every day. Yeah. So I'm more optimistic long-term than I am obviously short-term. Short-term <laughs> is where I think we have our real challenges. And so from that perspective, please, world, help us get everyone vaccinated. 
And again, all I can point out to you is if you don't get vaccinated, you will know potentially a very serious, serious COVID outcome. And if it's not you, it may be one someone you love. I have talked to too many parents, too many parents, who brought the virus home to their young children yeah. where that child ended up in a pediatric intensive care unit. You don't want to be that parent, trust me. Uh, Mike, thank you for taking the time. Uh, and uh, words to live by and words to listen to, those last ones from Mike Osterholm. Uh, thanks a lot, Doc. See you later.